All right, so uh, uh, everyone, welcome to this HEPTN seminar. Uh, very happy to have uh, Ananda Roy from Technical University of Munich uh, today. So thanks, Ananda, for giving this talk. Uh, and today he'll be talking about simulating quantum field theories with quantum circuits. Uh, so Ananda, thanks again, and please take it away. Okay, thank you, and thank you, Suki, for the invitation and. Um, I'm really happy that um, that we are um, continuing to have seminars in this age of COVID-19. Um, so I will. Uh, so I will structure it in a way that there will there should be time for questions, and um, please feel free to interrupt me at any time. And my goal today is to tell you about simulating quantum field theories with quantum circuits, and um, I want to present some of the recent results that we obtained um, with this uh, on this topic. But I want to first begin by, by going back to the pioneering thought of Richard Feynman, which gave rise to this whole field of quantum simulation, when he asked the question, what kind of computer are we going to use to simulate physics? And his motivation to ask this question was that the nature is inherently quantum mechanical, and so any efficient simulation of nature must also be quantum mechanical. And and the problem that, as, we, as you all know, is the, the problem of manipulating an exponentially large Hilbert space of a quantum many body problem on a classical computer. And so this is where he pointed out that with a quantum system with quantum computer elements. It is not a Turing machine, but a machine of a different kind. And um, in this sense, the one of the most native applications of quantum simulation would be in quantum chemistry in the simulation of complex molecules. Then as I will show you today, that quantum simulation has, has prospects of having important um, contributions in quantum field theory. And because of its ability to, to manipulate complex many body systems, it has great implications in condensed matter and statistical mechanics. And there are two ways to do quantum simulation. The first one is the digital approach. In this approach, one uses a universal quantum computer to simulate the system that you want to simulate. And the price of this universality is the fact that you need quantum error correction. And now there is a lot of effort in the world today to realize such a universal computing machine. But so far, we are still a bit certain distance away from the goal. And so a more near term goal is to look at analog quantum simulation where you um, where you tailor a specific quantum system to simulate another. And the trade-off here is um, universality for near-term achievability. Because this approach does not need quantum error correction, you will see, as I will show you um, in the talk, that there, are, there can be defects in these simulators, and that can give rise to errors. But they are not the same as what would affect a, a quantum computer. And what is really exciting about this approach is that there is a wide range of platforms that is available right now. And so this brings me to this next question, which we can now re-ask Feynman's question, but ask what kind of analog simulator are we going to use to simulate physics? And the first and the most prominent candidate is in the cold, are cold atoms, and Germany is at the forefront of this research. So here, cold atomic simulators have investigated strongly correlated systems, topological phases, gauge theories, and so on. Then there are trapped ions who have investigated problems in quantum magnetism and open quantum systems. And then in the recent years, quantum circuits have emerged as a viable candidate for simulating impurity systems or bosonic many body systems. And it is this last platform that I want to focus on today. And um, so some of you may know that quantum circuits, which are built on superconducting Josephson junction-based devices, they are one of the most viable candidates for digital quantum computing. This is the approach that is pursued in uh, many of these major companies like Intel and IBM and Google. But here I'm looking at a different aspect of these platforms where I look at their use in quantum simulation. And the history of probing many body physics with, with, with quantum circuits goes back to the experiments in Delft in the 1990s. But in the recent years, there has been a lot of progress in, in using these quantum circuits as quantum simulators. 
One of the first works was in the Devore group at Yale, where they investigated an array of 43 quantum Josephson junctions. Then there was work done in Rutgers, where they had arrays of 6 and 24 junctions. Then in Saclay in France, they had, um, and they had an array of about 100 junctions, and this was work in the Estev group. And then recently in the Roch group in Grenoble, they have arrays of 1500 Josephson junctions. And more recently in the Manucharian group in Maryland, they have now fabricated and investigated arrays of 33,000 quantum Josephson junctions. This picture is taken from their paper and each of these vertical bars here is actually a Josephson junction. And so there are 33,000 of them in the upper row. And then there is another 33,000 in the lower row. And you must appreciate something that we are not trying to build arrays of qubits. These are not 33,000 qubits. That would be a terrible idea because each of these qubits will have their own loss channels and then the system would decohere and it will not behave in a quantum coherent many body system. Instead, what we are trying to do here is to engineer an electromagnetic environment. And this can be then used to probe strongly interacting many body systems. And this is um, what I want to show you next. And to give you an example, let me just show you the kind of Hamiltonians that are realized with these circuits. So this is the picture again from the Maryland group and the corresponding equivalent quantum circuit is shown below. And there are, this is a 1D array and you can see that there are two objects in each unit cell. The first one is a capacitor and since it's shown in red, there is a charge plus two and minus Q on it on its plates and the Hamiltonian is Q squared over 2C0. And this I'm sure you know from classical electromagnetic courses. Now the second element is the one that is very important for this talk. It is a Josephson junction. And you can think of this as a parallel series of a capacitor and a nonlinear inductor. So the capacitor has charge again plus and minus Q. And then there is an inductor which is nonlinear which has some potential with the magnetic flux phi. And so the Hamiltonian is shown here, it's Q squared over two Cj minus Ej cosine phi over phi naught. This curly phi naught is the reduced flux quantum and the Q and the phi, they are not um, C numbers, they are quantum operators. So they obey this commutation relation, phi and Q in commutator is I h bar. Now with this knowledge, we can now write down the Hamiltonian for this quantum circuit. And for as a first step, we treat the circuit without disorder. Then what we have is essentially a Bose-Hubbard model with nearest neighbor interaction um, for quantum rotors. So this is what is shown here. So each term in the Hamiltonian comes from a circuit element. So I've color coded it accordingly. So the first term is the on-site repulsion term. So you see there is an Ni squared, where here Ni is the excess number of Cooper pairs on each island. And so you can think simply of like them as bosons, just normal bosons, except that now the Ni's can be positive or negative. This, this is because, so this is the reason why these are, this is a quantum rotor problem and not a boson problem. And then there is a nearest neighbor repulsion term which comes from this capacitance of this Josephson junction, which is Ni, Ni plus one. Then there is a, the quote unquote chemical potential term, which comes because of some gate voltage at each electro, at each node here. And then finally, there is the nearest neighbor hopping. This, this is just a term that shows that bosons can hop from one side to another. And Previously, the phase diagram, uh, before that, the, an important point is that the Ni and the phi j, they are canonically conjugate and they obey this commutation relation shown here. And the phase diagram of this quantum rotor bose hubbard model has been... Sorry, yes. can, can I have a question? Yes, please. Um, so, so, so the fact that you get like Ni, Ni squared, so like N is the number operator for bosons, right? Do I understand correctly? In the, the Ni is the excess number of Cooper pairs on oh. each side. Okay, uh, does it come from like a Q squared in the Hamiltonian? That or? is correct, absolutely okay. right. So it is exactly this Q squared term that you had seen earlier, except that in units of Cooper pairs, uh, Q is 2E, which is the charge of each Cooper pair times Ni. 
Okay. And and shall I think about uh, a site being defined by Josephson junctions or capacitors or both? Um, no, so the junction connects two sites. So you should think of the okay. site as this node here. So physically it would correspond to this red capacitor bar and uh, this this bar here on if you see my mouse pointer yes is this bar here the the orange and dark brown one and this brown one so this whole thing is an island the junction connects two islands and so and, and so the cooper pairs tunnel through the junction from one island to another and was there all at the bottom of this of this picture Ah, the, so so this is a ground. So in electrical circuits, you always need to measure the voltage with respect to a ground plane. And so here I'm showing you the, the electrical ground here. So this is potential zero and this thing has a, some finite potential. Okay, thanks. Yeah, no problem. And so, um, so now that we have this quantum rotor version of the bose hubbard model, we can analyze its phase diagram and so this is what is shown here on this right hand plot so you can see that we have lobe like structures in the in the phase diagram these purple lobes are not insulating lobes and then in between the two purple lobes there is a charge density wave lobe and where the system is some kind of nail ordered phase um, th those phases, I'm happy to tell you more about them and the phase transitions out of these loads, but our main focus um, is the Lattinger liquid phase, which occurs throughout this white area in the phase diagram. Because it is in this Lattinger liquid phase that the system is described by a ma free massless boson quantum field theory. And one of the characteristic features of the Lattinger liquid behavior is the fact that the correlation functions of of these boson creation and annihilation operators. So you can think of the first term as creating a Cooper pair at site zero and the second one destroying one at site R. This correlation function goes algebraically with the separation. And this exponent here, it is the, the exponent is known as the Lattinger parameter. And this relates to the compactification radius of the quantum field theory boson. And so just as an example, if I evaluate the Lattinger parameter here at this green dot, you can see that, uh, so this is IDMRG, infinite DMRG result. So you can see that the, the correlation is indeed um, decaying algebraically on a log log scale. This is a straight line and the Lattinger parameter is 0.62. Now, um, it is very important to, to realize that this is an idealized case you know, because we did not consider any disorder and most experimental realizations of this circuit have disorder. And then the lobes, which are these insulating lobes here, they will be replaced by a Bose glass phase. But what is very important is that the Lattinger liquid phase persists. And it is this phase that has been observed in experiments. And so this group in Maryland has observed the, the, the free compactified boson phase of the Lattinger liquid. And more recently in the in the Grenoble group, they have what they have done is to couple two such free compactified boson field theories with an impurity atom. So this is this atom in red here in the middle, and the equivalent quantum circuit is shown below. So you see there is the one free compactified boson on the left, another one on the right, and there is the impurity junction. Now this becomes a quantum electrodynamics problem in 1 plus 1 D. But the difference is with respect to conventional electromagnetism is that here we are coupling an impurity atom, which is the Josephson junction, to the modes not of the electromagnetic environment of free space, but of these Josephson junction arrays. And what that allows us is to actually look at very strong coupling regimes of quantum electrodynamics, and they can measure, for instance, very large lamp shifts of these atoms. And um, so this is, the reason for this um, can be traced back to the fact that the, the, the Josephson junctions have access to the so-called kinetic inductance of um, the Cooper pairs, and it's related to the fact that it works with superconductivity. What I want to tell you today is that um, these free boson quantum field theories that have been realized so far, it's just the tip of the iceberg and that there is a whole bunch of these quantum field theories that can be realized with quantum circuits. 
And so our vision is to simulate faithfully with quantum circuits, quantum field theories, generalizing the quantum sign Gordon model. And here the word faithful is important because here when we think of simulating a quantum field theory, we are trying to start from a lattice degree of freedom, which is which is essentially the same as the continuum lattice continuum degree of freedom. So if you want to start from compactified boson field theory, then you on a lattice, you would have these compactified lattice degrees of freedom. And this is important and in contrast to um, spin chain regularizations of quantum field theories and our motivation um, here, I won't have the time to go into this, but um, please ask me afterwards in, in this work here from 2019, where we showed that um, the, in multi-field scenarios, the, the faithful versus non-faithful regularizations make a big difference. Um, this is because bosonization, when you go from fermionic to bosonic field theories, do not faithfully capture all the non-perturbative properties, it's especially integrability is something that is often broken by these transformations. But and I, I can tell you more about this maybe afterwards. And our goal is to start from the quantum sign Gordon model and generalize it in one plus one space-time dimensions. And we choose the sign Gordon because of the fact that it can be straightforwardly realized with quantum circuits. And why do we do it this way? It's because um, integrable models can serve as ideal models to benchmark quantum simulators. And this is a problem that is also relevant in digital quantum computing, which is that if you have these quantum machines that are promising to solve problems which cannot be solved efficiently on a classical computer, a large part of this whole effort is to ensure that what we get is meaningful. And this is where integrable models come in because this is where we can we have analytical predictions for these models and we can check if our simulator is working correctly or not. And then we can systematically include integrability breaking perturbations um, into our circuit. And what is very convenient is that these quantum circuits provide, provide lattice regularizations which can be then used for numerical simulations. And I will be doing entirely one plus one D and there we have tools of um, DMRG, for instance, um, and which can be then used to either model an experimental setup closely or, or answer questions for which analytical predictions are, excuse me, difficult to come. And to do this, uh, we need two more circuit elements. So I have shown you the capacitor and the Josephson junction. We need the inductor which is this linear inductor with the, the Hamiltonian is phi square over 2L, phi is the magnetic flux, L is the inductance, and the mutual inductor. This uh, is something that couples two electric currents, and M is the mutual inductance. And the first three elements I'm sure you have seen before from classical electromagnetism, but let me just remind you that these are again all quantum operators and they all have their commutation relations. Now with these, we will build our quantum circuit lattices and the magnetic flux at a point in space time will be the bosonic field phi. The magnetic energy stored in an inductor will be the potential energy dx phi squared or phi squared. The charging energy of the capacitor will give rise to the kinetic energy term dt phi squared, or it can also give rise to an interaction between two bosonic fields, dt phi one, dt phi two. Then the energy stored in a mutual inductor will give rise to an interaction term dx phi one, dx phi two. And finally, the nonlinearity of the Josephson junction, the cosine potential will give rise to the nonlinear interaction. And this list is not exhaustive. As you can see, there is no sign of any fermionic mode here. And potentially we can try to include what are known as Majorana zero modes in the superconducting community uh, to, to give rise to fermions, but on an experimental front, this is um, still a bit distance away from being unambiguously established. And so we will just focus on bosonic theories. Okay, so we, you know, the plan is to analyze some properties of this free quantum field theory of a massless boson. This is the circuit that I already showed you. And then I will show you a, a one specific integrable perturbation of this massless boson, which is the quantum sign Gordon model. 
So um, what are the properties that we want to analyze for the free theory? And they are properties related to entanglement. Because these quantum circuits um, have a lattice regularization, so it's easy to cut the system into parts and then look at correlations and look at the entanglement structure. And um, so uh, here I'm showing you the Euclidean action. And so the action is shown here. The phi is the field. This is, you now we are doing one plus one D. And so this is with Euclidean metrics. So it's just the gradient phi squared. And um, K is the Lattinger parameter. Now, the first thing that comes to mind when you want to study entanglement uh, in these systems is to look at the von Neumann entropy. I will be doing entirely zero temperature, and so it's fair to call this the entanglement entropy. And it is defined as written here as minus trace log, sorry, minus trace of rho A log rho A, and rho A is the reduced density metric matrix of subsystem A. What was shown some years ago was that for these for, for this system, um, for an infinite um, size system, then the entanglement entropy grows logarithmically with the correlation length here with a coefficient that is, that is a universal property of this CFT, of, or of this quantum field theory. And this coefficient is determined by the central charge. In, you can think of this as the number of uh, degrees of freedom that, uh, that is undergoing um, long wavelength fluctuations. In this case, there is one free real boson, so it is the central charge is one. And S0 is a non-universal contribution. But in this sense, the, you can see that the entanglement entropy is too coarse because it glosses over all other properties of the, of the quantum field theory and focuses only on the central charge. So one can ask, how can we say something about the compactification radius or the Lattinger parameter from the entanglement and from the entanglement perspective? And then what about what happens to the entanglement if there are boundaries? And finally, what would be very nice is if you can say something about the entire operator content of the theory. And I will show you that because in one plus one dimension, conformal invariance is a very powerful tool, we can use this to make exact analytical computations. And then I will show you some numerical results which will validate these analytical computations. So let's try to answer the questions on the right hand side. So how do we incorporate the, the compactification radius? So for this, we will treat the system with boundaries. So this is the circuit that I had shown you, but now you see at the end, it is terminated by two Josephson junctions. And these give rise to the boundary conditions that we see. So the first is the Dirichlet boundary condition. So here, the phase phi is pinned to a constant value. And this is achieved by sending this Josephson junction energy to infinity. And the second boundary condition that we need is Neumann, which is when the gradient of phi is zero. And this is achieved by essentially deleting these Josephson junctions at the end, which is when EJ boundary is tending to zero. And so um, you can think in, of the of maybe the spin chain version, which is very easy to understand. So if you have the Ising spin chain, the transfer spin Ising model, then if you want to impose Dirichlet boundary condition, then you would apply a very strong magnetic field at the ends, so as to pin the spins in a certain direction. And the Neumann would correspond to not having any boundary field at the end. And this is exactly what I'm showing you here, except that it is done for the case of this bosonic field theory. And then what one can show is that the entanglement entropy now gets a contribution which is dependent on the boundary conditions. So the first term in maroon is again this term that is reminiscent of what I had shown you earlier. So you see again the C over six showing up. And then the thing inside the logarithm is a bit more complicated because it's a finite size system. But you can think of this as some effective length scale. And then there is this SB, which was not there before. And this depends on the boundary. And it can depend on the compactification radius. And then finally, there is some non-universal contribution. Now that we have understood how to get the compactification radius in the presence of boundaries, now what, one, what we can ask is, how can we get the complete operator content? And to do this, what we will do is consider the finite size system again with boundary conditions alpha on each side 
and then cut the system into two parts with this um, and this will give rise to another boundary condition beta and then we can look at the reduced density matrix of this subsystem A and then the entanglement Hamiltonian is defined as simply the logarithm of this density matrix as you can see here up to a scale factor and what was proved by by Cardi and Tony in 2016 was that the entanglement spectrum of this CFT for this bipartitioning is given by the physical spectrum of a boundary CFT. And the formula explicitly is shown here. So the entanglement Hamiltonian spectrum is on the left hand side. And on the right hand side, this non calligraphic H is the physical Hamiltonian of a boundary CFT. What is important is that uh, this boundary CFT now gets two boundary conditions. There's alpha and there is beta. So alpha is inherited from the parent CFT and beta is obtained from the entanglement cut. And so here in our, in our slides in the work that we did, we chose alpha to be either Neumann or Dirichlet and beta is just free boundary condition coming from the entanglement cut. And then HA depends, and we can show that HA depends on the complete operator content of the theory. Uh, sorry, Anand, I have a question, uh, just a quick one. Just uh, So to impose a boundary condition at the entanglement cut, I would do the same thing. So I would just change the Hamiltonian to include some term that... Yes, um, you would, but it would... Um, so off the top of my head, I wouldn't exactly know how to do it because you have to somehow impose some constraint on the underlying Hilbert space so, so that certain the ground state is not just the, the state of this of this free boson CFT so it, you have to perturb the, the Hamiltonian in a way but um, I wouldn't know how to make beta to be Dirichlet for instance so in principle what you say is true but I don't know how to do it okay thanks Okay, so um, now um, let me show you some, some results. So, sorry to, to, yes. to understand uh, what you just said. So what, what in, the, in, the, in the position of this cut, like the, the bosonic field can take any value, right? Yes. You don't put any conditions there. I mean, like it no, takes any right. values as it wants in uh, the vacuum, say, right? Exactly. Okay, cool. yeah. thanks. And um, right, so now, um, Let's, let me show you some exact computation of this entanglement spectrum. And so the problem then um, becomes essentially to compute the partition function of this boundary CFT. So you can think, you know, I'm showing you on the right hand side this picture. So you have uh, the boundary CFT is defined over a length interval L and over some, some circumference T here, which is inverse temperature. And then, um, then the alpha and beta are the boundary conditions. And um, so the you know so it, the the machinery kind of goes back to Cardi in 1980s and then Ishibashi and so on. So I won't go into too much detail, but you know feel free to ask me. But the basic idea is to compute boundary states and then compute the partition function. Um, what is um, nice is that it can be done exactly for the model that we look at. And and so this is what is shown here. Um, so the boundary CFT part, um, partition function was evaluated over this length L, which depends on the L naught and the bipartitioning length R in this way, and K is the Lattinger parameter. So I will show you the result only for the case when alpha and beta are Neumann, so both free. And then we can show that the entanglement spectrum energies, they are indexed by two indices, K and L. And um, so K can be both positive or negative integers and L is non-negative integers again. So um, we computed exactly this zero point energy. Um, I'm not showing you the, the explicit form because it's a bit ugly, but the, the important part is the, the shift from this zero point energy. So these, these terms, the first, the K dependent term course, um, comes from the dimension of the primary fields in the, in the free boson CFT and L is the descendant level. And, it, and at each energy level, in epsilon N K L, you have a degeneracy which is equal to the number of integer partitioning of L. 
and I'm sorry, so uh, now the, the thing is we can do the same thing for the Dirichlet boundary condition and then from there we can directly compute the change in the boundary entropy as you go from Neumann to Dirichlet and this is shown here, um, this delta S n to d is 1 over 2 log 2 over k, where k is the Latinger parameter. And you can then do a simple sanity check that this is uh, making sense by looking at the free fermion point, which is when the Latinger parameter is 1. And then uh, you, can, uh, you can think of two uncoupled Ising chains and, and then apply a magnetic field on one of them. And um, this, uh, and then if you do, you know, so the, the idea is to take these two Ising CFPs form them, so which are each um, one real fermion, and then you form a complex fermion, and um, then you can bosonize, and then you will get essentially the model that we are looking at. And then um, that we recover, what is important is that we recover this formula of one half log two, which is the original result of Affleck and Ludwig for the Ising model. Okay, so um, so these are the analytical results, and now I want to show you some DMRG um, results which validate these analytical predictions. So the first thing that we do is to analyze this circuit with infinite DMRG and check if this logarithmic scaling of the entanglement spectrum is working in the Latinger liquid phase. So I will sit at this green dot here, which is in the Latinger liquid phase, and then look at different properties. And so this is the, the logarithmic scaling of the entanglement entropy. As you can see, the, the scaling is reasonable and we do get the central charge of one. Then the next thing that is a finite size system and um, here now uh, we want- Ananda, sorry, I just have a quick question. Uh, what is the dimension of the local Hilbert space? It's, uh, sorry, I should have said, so it's nine. nine. At each side, there is then the local Hilbert space is nine. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, so now um, we, can, we can look at the entanglement um, energies for the Neumann case. And here we do a finite size of 400. And um, we look at by partitioning at the middle. So for a size of 200. And so this is the, these are the entanglement energies. So uh, there is a lot happening here. So let me go through it slowly. So on the X axis is I am plotting the K, which is this blue K on, in the formula on the right. And the, on the Y axis, what I'm plotting is some rescaled entanglement energy, which essentially gives you the L. So you, the L will go from the y-axis and has entries at 0, 1, 2, 3, etc. And, and the, and the x-axis can be from minus infinity to infinity. Here I'm showing from minus 4 to 4. And you can see that the spectrum indeed has these quote-unquote Virasoro towers. And um, the CFT predictions are given by these dashed lines. And the degeneracies I've written on the right hand side. So you can see um, if you look at the first few levels, you can see that there is this one has degeneracy in each of them one, next one also has one, then it has two, and so on. So we are reasonably confident that for the first few levels, we are indeed get indeed getting the CFT prediction. And then up here things get all foggy because of the fact that um, our finite truncation causes in the errors here, up here. Okay, so um, we can we did the same for the Dirichlet case. I am not showing you the results here, but you, I can show you. I have a slide for that. Um, what I want to show you next is this change in the boundary entropy from Neumann to Dirichlet, and this is what is shown here. And so we, we expect to get this formula one half log two over k, and here for the system size of four hundred here, and um, I'm showing you the entanglement entropy, and you can see that as soon as you are not in the first few sites, but then somewhere in, in the middle, the entanglement entropy goes from Neumann to Dirichlet by this amount, which is one half log two over k. And so I'm, I have shown you um, this, this arrow has a direction and it's because of the fact that we have indeed um, uh, an RG flow, which is popularly known as a boundary RG flow um, from Neumann to Dirichlet boundary condition. And um, so there is something called the, the G theorem, um, which is in analogy to the C theorem of Damolo-Chikov. 
where they show that you always have to have an entropy that goes down if you go from Neumann to Dirichlet. Okay, so um, I think um, this is where um, I am um, done with showing you some things for the free boson, and now I will show you something for the sine Gordon model. Um, I can take questions now on this part of the talk, or I can continue. So I have a question. You perhaps uh, talked about it, but uh, I, I did not really uh, get it. So, so in in, in the experimental uh, setup, what sets the compactification radius for the bosonic field? That's very good. So it's the the Lattinger parameter. So it's this k here. So in, in terms of the microscopic, so um, this can be uh, and so the Lattinger parameter. And so the compactification radius is one over square root of pi times the Lattinger parameter k. Okay, and in an actual experiment, the Lattinger parameter is determined by this Ej here, the Josephson junction energy, and this C naught here. So, so, can, so, so when you when you look at the when you look at the Hamiltonian, like uh, yeah, you see their compactification radius because of this cosine term appearing. Yeah, exactly, and that is correct. And let me show you the Hamiltonian again. Sorry, it's a bit far away. Um, yeah, I didn't, I didn't mean you to. <laughs> oh, that's okay. Perfect. At the beginning of your talk, yeah. There you are. So, you know, this this Ej here yeah. and this Ec0, they together determine the Lattinger parameter, which is then um, which is then um, determining the compactification radius. And it is exactly what you say, that we start from the underlying lattice degrees of freedom, which are compact bosonic fields, because we have this cosine. And the Ni's are then integers, plus or, mi plus or minus, both positive or negative. And then that's what uh, gives rise to the compactification values. Right. Also, so you're saying that, like in continuum, the compactification radius is going to be different. It's over here, like this phi i is uh, going to have periodicity of two pi, right? Or, yeah. Right. But you say that in continuum, like there's going to be some additional uh, contribution. No, the the compact. So in so the the Latinger action. Um, um, so sorry, the free boson action that uh, which is just the gradient of phi squared, it doesn't know about the that the field is compact, right? And because yeah, that's is, true. Yeah. Right, and so but then when you add this perturbation, it's actually it's what perturbation you add to to calculate, uh, for instance, the Dirichlet boundary condition, or when you look at expectation values of operators, they are all by adding cosine phi type perturbation, and that's when it knows the same compactification rate. Okay, thanks. Yeah, but so if you would, if you could add a cosine pi over two, then um, it would see a different compactification. But we cannot in this in this particular setup. In right? this in this case, no. That's right. Okay. Well, sorry. What plays the role of uh, a UV regulator in your experience? In this case, the the U. So the energy scale is set by the Josephson junction energy. So. In a, in, a, in an actual physical system, you can think that we are always making sure that the Josephson junction energy is is the largest energy scale in the flow and this EJ here. So, from the, so that's the highest energy scale that you can go. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So in terms of numbers, this is like 100 gigahertz. Okay. So now we go forward here. Um, Okay, so now I want to tell you how to realize the quantum sign Gordon model. And, um, and so this is the, the quantum sign Gordon model. Um, the Euclidean action is shown here. You have the, the free boson part, and then you have a cosine beta phi potential. And this model is classically also integrable. You can think of it as the limit of beta going to zero when this model becomes a nonlinear wave equation. And then you can solve it um, using a variety of techniques, and you can show that they, there are um, traveling wave packets which can propagate undistorted through this nonlinear medium and can scatter with phase shifts. And one such wave packet is the solitonic wave packet shown here. Then there is the anti soliton wave packet, which is the negative of the soliton. And then there are also localized wave packets, which are breathers. 
And remarkably, this classical integrability is not broken by quantum fluctuations because of the existence of conserved currents. And, um, but the difference now is that the spectrum depends on this value of beta. If you look at the number of the single particle excitation spectrum as a function of beta square over eight pi, you will see that for beta square over eight pi less than one half, you have solitons and anti-solitons and breathers, which are all the quantized versions, hence the hat on them, um, the quantized versions of these classical wave solutions. And then at one half, the system goes into a different regime where there are only solitons and anti-solitons. And at one, there is a costalist Taulis type phase transition after which this perturbation cosine beta phi is no longer relevant. So what we will do is entirely be in this part of the phase diagram. Now the question is, how can we go from this free boson to the quantum sine Gordon? And so here I'm starting from this free boson circuit that I showed you. And um, this is the action. And I choose the parameters such that I have um, I have the free boson theory, so somewhere here, let's say. And now what we do to get to the quantum sine Gordon is to simply replace this capacitor on this vertical link by a Josephson junction. So this is all that I did. And um, so the, the parameters have to be chosen appropriately, which is all shown on in the bottom um, right here. It's not super important for this talk, um, but, the, but the message is that the, the sine Gordon coupling beta is given by square root of pi times k. And now you see in, in this circuit, in each unit cell, there are two Josephson junctions. There is one on the horizontal link and there is another on the vertical link. And they play different roles. So the, the one on the horizontal link ensures that we are in the quantum regime when beta is of the order of one. Whereas, so this is the one that sets the Lattinger parameter and therefore it sets the sine Gordon coupling. And on the other hand, there is the sine Gordon nonlinearity. This is given rise to by this Josephson junction. We can again write down uh, a Hamiltonian for this circuit. And so it is very similar to the one that you already saw. So the first three terms are the same. You can see there is the on-site repulsion term. There is the nearest neighbor repulsion. There is the nearest neighbor hopping. But now there is another term, which is this last term here, which is simply the cosine phi of this Joseph's induction. And it is this thing that gives rise to the sine Gordon nonlinear. And I want to say that um, this circuit that I'm showing you here has never been realized experimentally, but there has been similar related works where they looked at long Josephson junctions and looked at solitons in the semi-classical limit. So um, some work in this, um, in this direction has already begun. Now, um, what we can do is to, because we have this lattice model, we can analyze it with the MRG. And so the first thing that we do is to calculate the expectation value of this of the lattice operator exponential of i beta phi. So I'm and the, on the right hand side, I'm showing you the exact results that are um, obtained for the continuum field, and I'm showing you see that there is not an equality but a proportionality because there is no reason why the continuum and the lattice in the expectation values have to be equal. They can they are up to a proportionality constant the same. But what is important is that uh, the scaling of this, uh, of this expectation value with this parameter that is tuned by DMRG um, is given here. And this is, it is this scaling that we, that we should analyze. And here is the result, so on the right hand side. So if you plot it on log log scale, you expect to see linear, linear slopes. And that's exactly what you see. And from the slope, you can extract the beta square over eight pi. And um, now to check that we are indeed getting the right answer, so what we can do is to compute beta square over eight pi from the corresponding gapless theory when we deleted this ej naughts from the from the Lattinger parameter. And this is shown on the right hand side. So in parentheses, what you see here are the expected values, and 
and the thing on without the parenthesis is what you get and you can see that the agreement is quite reasonable which gives us some confidence that we are indeed probing the quantum sign Gordon model. Okay, now what more we can do is to look at the ground state energy with respect to the free boson theory. And so this ground state energy exact formula has also been derived and it is shown here. And here is the result. So, so the, the circles are DMRG and the crosses are beta ansatz. And there is, there is an overall field normalization that is obtained from the previous plot or the, this one here. And then we just, we don't have any other fit parameters and we just apply the field normalization to match the CFT normalization of the, of the beta ansatz calculations. And then we see that the agreement for the ground state energy works reasonably well. And I'm showing you here only one of these parameters, but it works for all of them. Now, um, having done these two checks that indeed we are, which gives us confidence that we are indeed in the sine Gordon regime, then we can calculate the correlation function of these vertex operators shown here. And um, so these are done using form factors and so these are not exact results, but they are results which um, can be done systematically expanding the, the correlation function in terms of form factors. And so the, the dotted lines are the DMRG results and the, the solid line is a form factor. And you can see that the agreement is quite reasonable. And here again, there is no um, fit parameter. We just normal, use the field normalization from the two plots before to ensure that we are matching the, the CFT normalization conventions. And so here, I did not talk about it too much, but for this plot, we also needed to extract uh, not just the Latinger parameter or the beta square, but also the, the, the speed of light, so to speak, or the the plasmon velocity, which is obtained from the Casimir energy and so on. But you no, know, so we did all that and the result is this plot. Now I have still 10 minutes. And so um, I can maybe briefly mention that we can, we have also analyzed the entanglement spectrum of the sine Gordon model with DMRG. And um, so the basic, you, you recall what I showed you for the, for the free theory and here, the, for, the, for a massive interacting theory, the, there is something similar that can be said. And this was, uh, I think, first written down clearly in, in these two works of um, Cho, Ryu, and Ludwig, and also in Calabresi, Cardi, and Peschel. And the idea is the following, that if you have mm, a CFT with a massive bulk perturbation, and, and we restrict ourselves to perturbations by a single primary field, then, and this is the field phi here, and then if you cut it up in two parts, then the entanglement spectrum is the physical spectrum of a CFT with one side coming from the entanglement cut. So it's a free boundary condition and the other side coming from the, the field phi localized at the boundary here. And the length of this, this size of this CFT is given by the log of the correlation length. So you can see that um, that the previous result of Cardi and Tony, which is when it was the free theory, is just the version when when psi is when the when the correlation length is infinite for for the for this for this more general case, because then when psi is infinite, there is no no boundary perturbation. It the thing just sees sees the um, it sees the boundary condition from the parent model which comes at the end of this. Okay, and um, so this is the result for the, for the sine Gordon entanglement spectrum. And so you see again, equidistant levels. And so these are shown here and the CFT predictions with the degeneracies are shown here. So as you can see, the agreement is reasonable um, and we are suffering from um, finite truncation errors because here the, the U1 charge of the, of the free compactified boson is no longer conserved here. So the finite truncation errors are, are slightly worse. 
Okay, um, so what I showed you today are the, the results for the free quantum field theory of a massless boson. And then I showed you how to get the sine golden model from there and showed um, some DMRG results for that. This is not the end of the, the story here and um, I don't have time today and so you know, I leave it um, um, at that, but there, there are more exotic models that can be realized by the quantum circuits like the quantum double sign Gordon model, which we analyzed recently and where, um, where remarkably classical and quantum integrability part ways. So the model on the, this quantum double sign Gordon model is not integrable classically, it's classical wave equations, but quantum mechanically due to the presence of quantum fluctuations, it, it acquires integrability. And this is um, something that, that, that happens in many multi-field quantum field theories. Um, as an outlook, I want to remind you again that there are all these experiments that are being done throughout the world now. And um, there are many problems that need to be tackled, like for instance, finite temperature correlation functions, which, are, which pose a big challenge in computation um, you know, for even for the sine Gordon model. And then something that happens quite naturally is that when you open the system for measuring, then you also open it to dissipation. Then how does the spectrum of the, the sine Gordon model, for instance, change upon dissipation? It's also something that is largely an open problem. These experiments will be done in finite volume. And so quantifying finite volume corrections, there has been a lot of work that has been done in this. And finally, we might be approaching the time when we can see some of these finite volume corrections in an actual experiment. And there are for sure many more challenges that need to be addressed in, in, this, in this field. So um, th that's pretty much it. I want to thank you for listening and thank my collaborators. So the DMRG uh, results uh, were done in collaboration with Johannes Hausschild at, uh, at Berkeley and Frank Pohlmann in Munich. And mm, the beta ansatz stuff was done in collaboration with Hubert Seller in Saclay and Dirk Schurit in Utrecht University. That's it. Thanks for listening and I'm happy to take more questions. Okay, thanks a lot, Ananda. Uh, maybe we can all unmute and thank Ananda. Okay, questions? Can I ask a question? Uh, yes, Carl, please. This is Carl Jansen. It seems to me that your effective Hamiltonians in the quantum circuit are all one dimensional, right? Yes. Are there any thoughts of extending this to higher dimensions? Um, yes. Um, so th this is an excellent point. And um, there has been experimental works as well. So um, let me um, go back up here and look at the circuit again. So maybe let's look at the experimental picture and then it's clearer. So um, in 2D, it's not a problem because of the fact that, you know, in, it, this thing is on a plane. And so we can extend in both directions in the planar way. So two dimensional extensions to this have actually been realized. So the, the group in Princeton of Andrew Hauck has realized 2D circuits like that. Um, How many units? Um, so I think there they had, I think, seven, like about a hundred um, Josephson junctions. Um, but in principle, like because the horizontal direction is relatively long now, so that work was from like three years ago or so, and and so I would imagine that you can go further in two D. Um, but um, this is a lot of um, you know not all groups can can realize this. It requires a lot of infrastructure, and so um, I think it would be not not like an like an excessively easy thing for for all the groups. But but there is no fundamental obstacle in going to two dimensions in, in space. What, what I want to get to is the point that if you want to go to three dimensions, then the current modern day superconducting circuit technology is still rather at an infant stage when, when you look at 3D stacking of circuits. Because then you have to already, if you have a 2D array, then to probe each element separately, individually, you need to have come from the third dimension and mm -hmm then if you have a 3D array, then it gets extremely complicated. And I wouldn't, you know, be too optimistic about 3D arrays in the next five, 10 years. 
but like just like in DMRG, you can do 1D and 2D cylinders um, with a few sides long. This can be certainly imagined in the next few years. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. I have a question. Yes. Uh, you have uh, focused on uh, entropic based uh, quantities, and I was wondering what is the strategy to extract them in the experiment? That's a very good question. So, um, um, in, in superconducting circuits, there has been no experimental proposal to, uh, to get anything like Rennie entropies, um, unlike in the atom, called atoms or ions, where they have now started to look at um, extracting up to, I think, Rennie entropy of index two. So, um, what I showed you is purely theoretical and um, it's not something that could be extracted um, like this entanglement spectrum or something like this cannot be easily extracted from an experiment. What can be extracted from an experiment in these kind of um, quantum circuits is something like the Latin interparameter, then you can look at correlation functions. So, some of the thermodynamic quantities that I also showed for, for instance, the sine Gordon model. Um, so let me quickly go there. Sorry, this is not very efficient. But. So something like the two-point correlation function or something like the expectation value of this local field, these things can be experimentally measured um, by measuring in like the current, the, the effect of currents or voltages in these circuits. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. So I also have a question. So um, with uh, Mary Carmen, Carl, and uh, Johannes, who are all here, and Victor, who actually couldn't be here, uh, we actually got interested uh, in studying thermal correlation functions uh, using uh, transmetric methods. Mm -hmm. uh, and this was like one of the open problems that you mentioned uh, towards the end. Yes. Uh, can, can, you, can you expand uh, upon it a bit? Uh, in particular, uh, when it comes to possible experimental realization of, of the, the setup to, to, to actually uh, probe such, such quantities. Yes, yes. And um, so, um, so what we, um, what we imagine on doing is to, um, to comp so th this is, um, for instance, so the, this result that I showed you is something at zero temperature, the correlation function. And so what we um, hope to get to at some point is to, um, is to compute um, the, the, the correlation functions at a finite temperature, which is not too high compared to the UV cutoff. So um, in, in, in particular, in Josephson junctions, the experiments are done at, let's say, milli Kelvin, and the, and the junction energies are of the order of approximately Kelvin, let's say. So if there is a factor of about, um, it's not exactly Kelvin, so let's say there's a factor of 10 to 100 difference. And so um, we are looking at relatively low temperatures where, um, from my understanding of DMRG, it is difficult to reach those um, for these large local Hilbert space problems because the time evolved block decimation um, is inefficient. And so here um, I would be very happy and, and uh, to learn more about uh, what you have in mind in terms of techniques to compute. What I had more in mind was to look at finite temperature form factors in finite volumes and then calculate correlation functions, which would be possible for the sine Gordon, even though it's technically complicated. Well, we, we, we look at the retarded correlator using uh, TBD, uh, and then that, uh, well, I mean, like it's, it's, it's quite a bit of a story, but uh, I mean, like, uh, you can certainly do something with, with test networks that uh, reproduces. Uh, a lot of the features of underlying uh, continuing uh, field theory. Uh, yes, that's and so. This would be indeed possible. So, and um, actually, um, so I had um, so because this quantum circuit is um, it is faithfully showing the continuum theory. But um, what it does is that it um, it has a very large local Hilbert space, which is bad for TBD. And so, what we can do using what you said, we could do it for this model, which is the the, the XYZ chain of Baxter. And so this is the Hamiltonian. You can see these are now spins. And so the local Hilbert space is a very delightful too. And, and so 
then if you choose, um, so the, the fact that the XYZ spin chain gives rise to the sine Gordon model, it is not my 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 creation. It's it's been known and been around for a long time. So these are the references, and um, and so the way to think about it is to go from XXZ, which is the free company, the Latin liquid, and then you add a small mass term in the coupling between JX and JY, and then you get the quantum sine Gordon model. And so this then can be used for um, to do the TBD um, in the way that you describe, and that would be, I think, numerically more efficient than using the quantum circuits. Does that um, does that help? So, so basically, you're saying to to to, to, to use as a starting point different uh, UV composition of of. Uh, of the or not even completion discretization of the quantum sine model which is embedded into the spin chain. Um, I, I, maybe my internet is not so good, but could you say that again? Oh, sorry, uh, it's it's probably mine. Uh, what what I was saying is that like you, you you're saying to to embed the, the sine Gordon uh, model uh, in a spin chain instead of mm -hmm. uh, starting with these Joseph's yes. junction. For finite temperature correlation functions, um, it is um, it is better to do that. Yeah, 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 yeah. But you could simulate this on the quantum circuit also, right? Yes, it will, it's just slower. So um, it's the time evolution is done, but I think it scales with fourth power of the local Hilbert space. So it's vastly slower compared to the, to the spin model. I see. Yeah. What is and the reason for this? Can you? It's the, the algorithm of the TBD, which, in, which have, involves applying two side operators in each side. The way that it works is the scaling of the. I'm with you. Yes, I'm with you. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I get it. Mm -hmm. Right. So um, it's a curious thing that, that you mentioned. Um, so uh, maybe I can just mention this. And um, because you know, one has to be a bit careful. So um, when you do this, the reason why the quantum circuit because of uh, corrections to scaling. So uh, since we have, uh, do I have like a couple more minutes to tell you this? Yeah, sure. Yeah, okay. Um, so the idea is that um, as was shown by Luther and by Lukianov is that the, the, the spin operator sigma plus is the, the sine Gordon operator exponential i beta phi over two. But you see now there is a very important distinction from the quantum circuit, which is that there is there are these three dots here, which correspond to corrections to scaling. And this is in, in the definition of operators, because in the quantum circuit, we always look at compactified boson fields. This correction is not there. And so simply if you look at corrections to scaling, then the, the lattice Hamiltonian gives rise to corrections to the QFT Hamiltonian, but it also, the QFT operators get corrections from the lattice operators. And so for the correlation function of these vertex operators, this works um, um, worse in the case of the, the XYZ spin chain. And so let me just, to give you a simple, and this is, uh, there is numerical um, data that supports this. So these all um, exponential I beta phi on the, on the left panel and exponential i beta phi over two on the right panel, they are all supposed to grow linearly in a log log scale or um, for the, with the mass parameter of the sine Gordon action. But you see that while the quantum circuit keeps going linearly all throughout, here the XYZ spin chain at a, at a certain large mass parameter here, which corresponds to a smaller correlation link, so that when the corrections to scaling come in, then you see that they drift away from there. And, and so one has to make sure that uh, we are really reaching the scaling regime in the XYZ spin chain much more than in the quantum circuit. So this is you know, a technical remark, but it's, uh, it can be accounted for. So, um, but we have, to, we have to be a bit careful with the XYZ spin chain. Yeah, I'd like to ask another thing about uh, the uh, entanglement spectrum that you uh, showed in the last part. Uh, yes. So, uh, if I understood it correctly, you were considering uh, one-dimensional or one-dimensional spatial uh, MPS. 
So yeah. if you make a cut there, you have uh, like a zero dimensional subsystem. And um, as you explained earlier, the, the modular Hamiltonian would be, or you can equivalently see it as a thermal, um, uh, or the, the dense or degrees of freedom of uh, one uh, spatial dimension less. Um, in for these models, it's actually not a dimension less. It is uh, this is the. Can you see my screen? Uh, yes. Okay. So here it's actually not a dimension less, but it's just that um, now the the entanglement Hamiltonian sees only a CFT over length log psi with a boundary perturbation. It's not actually a dimension less as is true for higher dimensional systems. That is true. Oh, so, so it's a, a special uh, property of uh, yes of one plus one d CFTs uh, with it. perturbations. Yes. But uh, c can you take uh, or how do you actually then calculate uh, the the lock or do you calculate the lock uh, to of the reduced density matrix to get? Uh, uh, um, you know, um, when you cut at the middle, then what what you get is from the Schmidt decomposition eigenvalues then you directly get the entanglement spectrum. Then it's a simple matter to just take the log of these eigenvalues because these are all C numbers. So you, you don't actually, so, um, maybe this is something that I did not emphasize before. If you were to take a block um, from an infinite system, a finite block, then this would be um, computationally very heavy because you would then have to diagonalize this big matrix. But what we do here is all is we try to avoid this, this, this approach. And what we do is simply cut the system into two halves and then simply the Schmidt eigenvalues are directly the entanglement spectrum of the density matrix. Okay. Thank you. Okay, if there are uh, no further questions, uh, let's thank Ananda again for this nice talk.